he would actually work with different organizations to sever ties. I've never covered a case like this where someone comes clean, directly admits to most of what has been accused of them. I don't know where we go from here. Zero! Gonzalo Barrios is a YouTuber, gym goer, and former professional gamer. Born in Chile, he started competing in Smash Bros tournaments in 2006. By 2011, he had built enough online reputation to achieve a sponsorship with Triple V Gaming. From there, the rest is history. Zero was dubbed the best Smash Bros 4 player of all time, holding a streak of 56 tournament wins between November 2014 and October 2015, with Team Liquid's Nairo ending his run. During the same year, he signed with competitive org Team Solomit, which had GameCube Smash player Leffen already on its books. However, in January 2018, Zero announced his retirement from competitive play, deciding to focus on building his online presence and to start creating content around the game. In June, he separated from TSM, but months later it was announced he had signed for another organization, Tempo Storm. His career was on an upwards trajectory. He became one of the many creators poached during the streamer contract wars, signing an exclusive deal with Facebook. His status attracted various sponsors and his fan base expanded. However, one moment would turn that on its head, setting up one of the most contentious sagas in recent history. Gonzalo Zero Barrios, known as one of the most successful Smash players of all time, did come clean of allegations and accusations, stories involving underage girls. I made a tremendous mistake, and I decided not just to give up, but to sabotage myself on purpose. He's never offered any type of remorse or any type of apology whatsoever. This was a big plot to assassinate my character and just, just destroy my life. Thanks to the guys at Atlas VPN, our connection is secure. Right now, they're running a huge discount. It means you can get a three year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30 day money back guarantee. With Atlas VPN, you can browse the web without worry, as all malicious links, pesky ads, and trackers are blocked. You'll even be notified when someone is trying to steal your data. You can also access content from around the world. I use Atlas VPN to get past those pesky region locks to check out the latest F1 news during race week. You can basically travel the world without even leaving your bed. Atlas VPN gets you the best deals while shopping online, including online subscriptions, airlines, hotels, and more. What's better is that one subscription protects all your devices. So what are you waiting for? Time is running out. Head down to the description to secure three years of Atlas VPN for just $1.99 a month. July 2020 was a big month for the gaming industry. Hundreds of stories regarding systemic discrimination and abuse were discussed publicly, throwing many influential people into the spotlight. What has been described as the gaming world's Me Too movement led to discussions about the issues and lack of feasible action within the industry. The Smash scene was an area where this was endemic. A few of Zero's former associates were some who had allegations levied towards them. He decided that because he had some contact with them, he would release a statement. His twit longer, titled My Story, recounts his relationships with three individuals accused of predatory behaviour within the Smash scene. He states that he had known each of them for a long time and felt guilty, suggesting he didn't do enough to detect any red flags. He contextualizes his character, emphasizing that he is antisocial and introverted. Through this, he distances himself from the events where the alleged incidents occurred, apologizing for not being there to intervene. He establishes his relationship with the first two players, Keitaro and D1, describing how he perceives them. He explains he had never seen them in the environments where they offended, and says that his distance left him in the dark about their true characters. Keitaro is described as goofy and the party animal, 
and that's how Zero perceived him after knowing him from a younger age. D1 was a brother figure for Zero, describing him as an inspiration. He would provide logical and compassionate advice, and they had experienced hardships together. Zero was heartbroken that he was now being discussed in a different light, that there was another side to their characters that he didn't know about, hidden in plain sight. Zero then discusses the third person, one of his long-standing rivals and the man who was able to break his winning run in Smash 4. He describes his rivalry with Nairo as one that compares to a Hollywood film. They were enemies who eventually found common ground only to sour again when Zero left competitive gaming. He recounts his experience from 2016, when he noticed Nairo with his victim, Captain Zack, at various events. He says he thought nothing of it, and that Nairo had suggested that he was taking Zack under his wing to fulfill his potential. Zero apologizes to Zack because he did not interrogate this relationship any further. He concludes his story by suggesting that he was unaware of many of this behavior because he had stepped out of the competitive scene and had existed within his own bubble for the past few years. He restates his regret for not intervening and feels pain because the people he knew were not who he thought they were. He apologizes, suggests he needs to do better, and asks for advice on what he can do. The common theme with this statement is Zero's disbelief towards the true character of some of his closest friends, expressing remorse for not intervening. However, he explains why he didn't intervene, establishing his ignorance towards what happened. Apologizing for the actions of others and asking how he should do better is confusing when his statement essentially establishes plausible deniability. Regardless, he is clearly supporting the victims, which is a powerful stance considering his position within the community. However, who could have foreseen that Zero's public statement would end with him on the receiving end? A former Smash community member quoted Zero's tweet alleging he had shown them inappropriate content when they were a minor, as well as harassing them during their time together in the infamous Sky House. Jisoo was an artist who left the community in 2018 due to someone within the community abusing her, holding her financially hostage, and controlling her life. She responded to Zero's tweet longer because she felt it was hypocritical for him to condemn his former friends because he contributed to the environment in which she was abused. Before Jisoo's response, Zero had suggested that he would make a video about the situation within the Smash community. However, very quickly that changed, and he announced he was preparing a statement. He eventually released a Google Doc titled, Zero Response to Allegations. The document directly responded to Jisoo's tweet, and Zero asked that people reserve their judgment until they read it. He says he was shocked because he assumed they were on good terms, even after they stopped being roommates. Because of his introverted nature, as mentioned in his previous tweet longer, he spent most of the time refining his smash abilities, leaving little time to interact with Jisoo. After emphasizing that he does not want anyone to attack or harass her, he states that it is very important to listen to victims. After opening the document, he outlines the timeline of his presence within the Sky House, providing a screenshot of his American Airlines travel itinerary that shows him traveling to LA from Chile in late 2014, and back again in early 2015. He provides links to videos where the houses he was in are documented, and presents a timeline of his movements, including the people he was with. In May 2015, he returned to the Sky House, which a few months later moved to a new residence, which Jisoo did not follow. After this, he only interacted with her online and at tournaments. The next part of his document outlines the relationship he perceives to have had with Jisoo, illustrated through messages with her. He described her as a friend, and even after leaving the Sky House for the first time, she was friendly with him. Jisoo often referred to him by nicknames, which made him uncomfortable he didn't raise any issues. He follows this with more screenshots that suggest she was comfortable around him, and includes screenshots of her asking him to promote her work as more evidence. His final interaction with her shows her asking for help in judging a combo from Smash 4 in a giveaway for TwitchCon, which he also suggests shows her being comfortable enough to ask him for a favour. 
He continues, sharing a conversation about her asking him to protect her property, suggesting she trusted his character. Zero says these were examples of their online interactions, but couldn't provide much material to represent their in-person interactions, other than two videos where Jisoo audibly laughs. So I called myself Kodu and got the joke. Wow. <laughs> King of the universe. Zero includes a message from his girlfriend Vanessa, stating how she perceived Zero's relationship with Jisoo. She describes what she saw as a brother-sister relationship, and that he introduced her to Vanessa, often greeting her at tournaments. She recounts the first time she met Jisoo, suggesting that Zero had ordered some shirts for them as they had complimented Jisoo's work. She says she was confused to see Jisoo's accusations. Zero accompanied Vanessa's message with a screenshot of him asking Jisoo about the shirts they ordered. After contextualizing his relationship and describing his time at the Sky House, he addresses the claims within Jisoo's tweet. He links a video that shows the big screen mentioned in her tweet, then explains that he would not have looked at inappropriate things on the TV because other people lived in the room. He mentions lack of privacy, and that should he have done anything inappropriate, another person would have seen it. He then discusses the explicit content she claims to have been shown. He states that he doesn't really use Craigslist, nor did he have any sexual interaction with Jisoo, despite that not being a part of her claims. He admits he looks at hentai, but says he would not do that in a room full of people, suggesting it may have just been one of his pranks towards fellow rumor M2K. He doesn't recall any harassment towards Jisoo in the Sky House, and says that his message logs from the time suggest otherwise. Jisoo's tweet was only two sentences, but Zero responded comprehensively to what was vaguely suggested in her tweet. Considering she was responding to his tweet longer, it seems that she was making the point that his ignorance towards the actions of other creators was a lie, because he was a part of the culture that enabled predatory behaviour. Her tweet was supported with a tweet longer describing her experiences in the community, recalling her experience shared in 2018. Beyond that, there wasn't much to take from her tweets other than her being irritated with the contents of Zero's statement. Another community member joined the conversation with their own twit longer. Leffen, Zero's former teammate, discussed his thoughts about the situation and what Jisoo suggested in her tweet after she reached out for advice on how to navigate it. He suggests she wasn't out to cancel Zero, instead question his ignorance towards the actions of others. He discusses how he met Zero in 2013 and recalled an incident where Zero and some Japanese players had sat on his sleeping bag one of them hugging his pillow, and they allegedly shared explicit images of their waifus. Leffen ties us back to Zero's statement in his Google Doc that he would never look at hentai in a room full of people, suggesting his experience contradicts that claim. Leffen's twit longer wasn't all that much, simply suggesting Zero should be held accountable for being a part of the toxic culture within the Smash community. Jisoo's accusations weren't explained further, Leffen even stating that he did not know their full context. However, that would all become irrelevant very quickly. The story immediately shifted from Zero claiming ignorance towards the issues within the Smash community, to Zero being accused of misconduct. A girl named Katie, using a burner Twitter account to protect her identity, released a twit longer named Dear Zero. All I wanted was an apology. The twit longer is a public letter to Zero. Katie explains that she used to participate in the Smash community when she was 14, she had Skype conversations with Zero between September 2014 and January 2015. She says they met when she messaged him in his Twitch chat, in which he took an interest and provided his Skype username. Zero's recent achievements and rising status left her starstruck. She was a young girl, enraptured with the idea of being friends with someone she looked up to and admired. Zero capitalized on her youthful naivety to flirt, manipulate, and ask her for sexual favours when he was 19. In her twit longer, she lists her accusations clearly and concisely. First, she says Zero called her Kitty, Kitten, Honey and All Mine whilst flirting with her. Then she says he manipulated her, 
She gives an example suggesting he called her a pervert and made her believe it, but she was being goaded to say things by him. He told her she was his secret. She asked him to confirm his identity in streams, and he would do things on stream to satisfy that, but he never acknowledged her directly by name, anywhere other than Skype. Her final accusation is what would bring Zero's name into disrepute. Let me read it verbatim. The worst offence I can remember is that you asked me to masturbate with ice and take pictures. I lied when I told you I masturbated as you asked, and then I declined sending you pictures. The worst part of this is that I did not take screenshots of this particular situation since I was so embarrassed by it. You wanted to make this activity a habit, that every two weeks I would do what you say for a day. Katie also provided screenshots of Skype conversations from 2014. There are 24 screenshots between September 21 to 25 and conversations on December 12. These screenshots were also captured on three different occasions, some on the day of the 21st, some on December 15, and the rest on Boxing Day 2014. Katie's screenshots are ordered chronologically, so we will start from the beginning and observe how their conversations would develop over time. We are introduced to Katie pretending to cheer Zero as a cheerleader, which he describes as adorable. Katie reacts, outlining her perception of him. He describes her as an adorable cutie. Zero continues into the next screenshot, where Katie describes him as one of her favourite role models and names herself his official cheerleader. The next screenshot shows Katie describing herself and promising to send Zero a picture of herself in the morning, presumably to show him what she looks like. She also asks if they could video call, to which he agrees. On to the 22nd of September, the conversation context is unclear. Katie appears to be discussing her homework, and Zero asks if she can sneak something in before finishing. It appears as if their conversation develops into advice about Smash, where Zero describes Katie as the most adorable of girls in response to her saying she breaks down when playing with guys Zero's age. She thanks him for his breathing advice and suggests she will do it more when talking to him. Zero responds to an unseen message with yo adorable, where Katie is pointing out who she is and what she says was a picture of her and a friend from her Instagram. Zero continues to call her an adorable cutie. He then teases her as she reacts. We now move on to the 23rd, where Zero is teasing Katie about something while she is in class. He calls her adorable again, teases her, and refers to her as honey. The teasing continues. He calls her adorable again and names her Kitty Cat Katie. He also pulls out the you're going crazy for me line yet again flirtatious teasing. The teasing and flirting continue. He suggests her reactions translate to her loving him, and he calls her adorable and teases her more. Katie says her best friend said hi to him because he had made a face so red. He continues to tease her, but in response to her suggestion that his Twitch viewers may be interested in his reaction, he calls her his secret. In this screenshot, he says she is such a cutie and a mad adorable girl stating that no one knows what they are doing. Katie reacts, and Zero teases her again. 13. More teasing. 14. Even more teasing. Katie sarcastically asks him if he wants a girl that bad, to which he responds that he wants her. She questions him, but he tells her not to worry and fulfil his request. She retorts, and he says because she is adorable. She then asks what he meant about wanting her. The conversation moves forward a couple of hours, where Zero is hurrying Katie to send him a message of love or encouragement. She eventually sends him a fan mail type message that she says she was supposed to send him through email. This is some sort of role play where she sends Zero fan mail. In the second message, she describes her devotion to him, disclosing her age and referring to herself as his cute, adorable kitty. From the last screenshot, it seems he had requested her to send this as she says, if that's not enough, I don't know what is, after her fan mail. Zero responds, saying he was surprised and didn't know she had such strong feelings for him. He says he is honoured and that she is adorable and very nice. He also says that they should talk more and that he would like to get to know her some more and that her message hit him hard. We skip forward a few more hours, and Zero is talking about Hbox, a Smash player. 
and mentions his connections with people in the industry. Now we move on to the 24th, and Zero calls Katie adorable again, keeping in mind she had explicitly stated her age the day before. We quickly proceed to the 25th, and a conversation follows him saying, Now you hate me, I guess I'm a perverted burr, to which Katie says he is overdoing this, possibly more roleplay. He says he loves how she reacts to things, and calls her adorable again, suggesting she acts like a cat having its belly rubbed. She responds by telling him that he will not rub her belly. He then says, yeah, why only do that? 45 minutes later, their conversation progresses to him suggesting that he would be normal should they arrange a fortnightly deal where he can go all in for a day. Katie tells him to swear on the river Styx, a reference to the Percy Jackson series. Zero responds, swearing on the river Styx, that he promises to be normal if on those days she would be his. She agrees. The next screenshot takes us forward about three months since their first interactions. Katie is asked about what grade she is in, and responds by saying she is in the night. Zero says she is a baby, and describes that as adorable. He then asks if she is looking at any boys. In a message slightly above, Zero says Katie is pretty. He tells her to find a nice, caring boy, and she responds that most of them are jerks. She describes the context of this final screenshot as a running joke as she liked a Smash player and how he played a certain character. Zero describes Katie as a perv and mentions that she is still a baby. Zero describes Katie as adorable on 15 occasions throughout these screenshots, even after her age is explicitly stated in the 17th screenshot. There's a large gap between the final screenshot from September 25 and those from December 12. I assume the conversations continued similar to how they did during their first week. Katie provided reasonable evidence to support her accusations that Zero flirted with her and encouraged her to reciprocate. She also explicitly stated that he was her role model, giving him a level of influence over her actions. His messages indicate interest in her, and he wanted to keep her as his little secret. What is displayed in those screenshots is predatory behaviour. Despite not having explicit evidence to confirm her allegation of his ice cube fetish, the fact he wanted to arrange something every fortnight supports her accusation about him wanting to make the activity a habit. In other words, Zero needed a convincing explanation for these screenshots. Katie explains why she never revealed her story, saying she blamed herself and invalidated her own experiences. The screenshots she saved were for posterity rather than to document the worst parts of her situation. She also felt that because she was not assaulted, her story wasn't worth being told, but she realised that the predatory behaviour was important to disclose. She also feared the backlash she would receive because of Zero's status. However, the stories that emerged from the July wave encouraged her to speak out, and that her experience should be acknowledged. Releasing her story is what she believed would help close that part of her life to move on, and she ultimately put the ball in Zero's court to choose how to respond. Following Katie's story, Jisoo elaborated on a tweet with a few more accusations levied towards Zero, including the allegation that he had started dating his girlfriend Vanessa when she was 15, and he 20. Zero was forced to make another response. The allusion towards some enabling predatory behaviour had developed into allegations of misconduct. In another Google Doc, titled the same as his last, he responds to Jisoo's new tweets, Leffen's statement, and Katie's story. He opens with an apology. He also requests that none of his followers targets anyone he discusses in the document. The first part of this document responds to two of Jisoo's tweets. The first is her claim that she received death threats due to her original tweet. Zero reaffirms his stance on harassment, and moves on to the second tweet, where Jisoo outlines her issue with his initial response. He immediately rejects her claim that he had started dating Vanessa when she was 15 and he was 20. Instead, she was only two years his junior. He also says they only had sexual interactions after she turned 18 and they had developed their relationship. He then addresses a paragraph to Jisoo. He says that after investigating her claims further and reading Leffen and another person's statements, he could understand Jisoo's pain and believes she wanted an apology from him. He apologises, particularly for not helping her when she was vulnerable. He then moves on to Leffen's statement, 
where he says most was covered in what he addressed to Jisoo. However, he does focus on Leffen's retelling of how they met in 2013. He confirms that he remembers the events, noting that he was 17, the Japanese players were older than him, and that they shared a few anime girls as a joke. He rejected the notion that they had shared explicit images, suggesting that the definition of explicit varies, but he doesn't remember showing anything terrible. He cites his social awkwardness and apologises to Leffen for making him uncomfortable, suggesting his desire to fit in with the other players because of his social occlusion was the reason why it happened. How Jisoo and Leffen felt about Zero wasn't all that important. They complained that he was dishonest with his original statement regarding the allegations against his friends and rival. He said he was unaware of the toxic culture within the community, which is what they contested. Interestingly, he doesn't address that aspect of their statements, instead apologising for how he supposedly made them feel. Regardless, his response to Jisoo and Leffen was unimportant, compared to how he responded to Katie's allegations. He claims he has never met Katie, nor had they sent each other graphic pictures, which was also what Katie said in her statement. However, he also claims he didn't know her age until she told him, which contests what she said. He confirmed that they did talk, but he does not have any logs of these conversations, so he would discuss each screenshot individually. He also confirms that he was 19 at the time of the messages. He begins with screenshot number 6, where he is responding to a picture of Katie on September 22, and says he regrets his horrendous comments. He then comments on screenshot number 17, where Katie sent a fake fan letter that includes her age on September 23. Zero suggests this was the point at which he learned Katie's age, and said his response was awkward because he was surprised. Next, he comments on screenshot number 20, where he is flirting with Katie on September 25. He essentially acknowledges that he was flirting with a 14-year-old, describing it as shameful and gross. He apologises. We then move on to screenshot 21, the one where he promises to be normal if he had a day every fortnight where he could go all in. However, he doesn't acknowledge that part of the screenshot, but rather the origin of his response to her telling him to swear on the River Styx, a reference to the Percy Jackson series. He acknowledges that the comment was inappropriate, but insists it's a quote or lyric, not him. But that's just not true. Screenshots 20 and 21 are 45 minutes apart. It's a continuation of his flirting. He understands it's inappropriate, but he doesn't suggest he should have stopped after supposedly learning her age two days prior. He then moves on to screenshots 22 and 23, suggesting that this was the end of their interactions. He says that after learning her age, he felt uncomfortable and wanted to cease communication with her, but didn't know how. He says he didn't want to cut her off or ghost her, suggesting this was a lack of judgement on his behalf for not stopping immediately, and that he was urging her to find another boy in these messages. That would be reasonable, except that these messages are nearly three months apart. It took him nearly three months to try and cut contact with her. It was nearly three months after he had supposedly learned her age. What exactly took him three months to stop? The final screenshot he reveals is the last, number 24. Katie described the context of what they were saying as a running joke based on her liking another Smash player. Zero suggests he was continuing from their prior exchange. However, that doesn't explain his responses. He says this was another attempt at him trying to exit the conversation, and he couldn't do it without being direct. He apologises and says he isn't excusing it, but his reasoning isn't sound. He also only responds to 7 of the 24 screenshots, so it's not a comprehensive response to all the material that Katie provided. It was selective and catered towards how he decided to reply. There are already some verifiable inconsistencies, and the admission that he continued to flirt with her despite knowing her age. So you would hope for further explanation within his response. He closes Katie's part with a paragraph stating that he regrets what he did and felt terrible. Despite Katie suggesting otherwise, he claims to have apologised, arguing that it probably wasn't good due to his awkward nature. He then proceeds to apologise to Katie. Despite appearing remorseful, Zero doesn't directly respond to any of Katie's complaints. 
He vaguely touches on the idea of him flirting with her, however the screenshots he chose to respond to did not show the full extent of his conversations with Katie. Notably, the many screenshots of him saying she is adorable, and naming her his secret after just two days of talking to her. He frames it as a one-sided exchange that he was reacting to her advances and didn't know how to handle it because of his awkward character. But as we saw earlier, the conversations show him poaching a response from her. He was actively teasing her, so it's not surprising that he excluded the full context of their conversations. Zero also ignores Katie's accusation that he requested to send explicit images of her masturbating with ice cubes, which she described as the worst request he had made during their fortnightly arrangements. He included a screenshot where he's seen proposing this idea of a fortnightly arrangement, but insists he was quoting the novel series that Katie enjoyed. The fact he not only doesn't deny what she claimed, but avoids it altogether is very concerning, and it leaves much to speculation. After responding to the statements from the three named authors, he outlines why he believes his character was corrupted, documenting the trauma he had experienced throughout his early life. He describes a story of domestic violence, abuse and misogyny, even commenting on how flawed the justice system is for women facing abuse. As a child, he witnessed life-changing situations, ultimately traumatizing him. His mother's financial situation meant he couldn't attend school, becoming a recluse and developing mental disorders. His return to school was hard. In middle school, he was bullied. One time, he was assaulted by an older boy and threatened into silence transferring schools as a result. He then describes life after this traumatic period, suggesting he internalized the trauma and minimized its impact. He says because of the experience, he had convinced himself he was gay, and presented himself as such for many years. Because of that, he was the target of homophobic attacks. Through all this, he played Smash as an escape from the hardships of reality. So when he was able to relocate to the States, Zero was born. To end his story, he recounts how his sister passed and how only recently he could accept that she was gone. To conclude his document, he says he would reflect on what he had done and improve himself as a person. He noted how his trauma, mistakes, Wreckfall's death, and the true character of former friends had impacted him, leaving him at breaking point. He closes by asking if he can do anything to improve things. There's something strange about revealing your trauma to suggest a reason behind your actions when responding to another person who has accused you of being the source of theirs. He spent 60% of this document outlining his trauma and less than 20% responding to what Katie alleged. That's not exactly the most compelling response to an accusation of serious misconduct. So it's very hard to acknowledge the sincerity of his apology if he didn't go through the effort to discuss the issues she put towards him comprehensively. It's hard to believe he saw Katie as just a friend, given the screenshots she provided. It's not how you would usually talk to a 14-year-old girl as an adult. After he published his response, he tweeted that he was going to ban himself from Smash events permanently, and that he was going to take a break from the internet and content creation for some time. On the same day, Jisoo tweeted that she was compiling everything, along with many others, to bring people the truth. The next day, after his document responding to Katie, Jisoo, and Leffen, he published a much shorter twit longer. I have to come clean. Hey, I can't sleep. And I just can't take this back and forth. I don't think it makes sense to keep this going. I just want this all to stop, and for me to at least atone. I also want people to stop defending me. I don't deserve it. He then proceeds to essentially concede to Katie's accusations. Katie. The screenshot you guys were wondering about the ice cube thing, it's true. The claims that Katie makes are true in general. There are no graphic pictures of anything of the sort, but it's unforgivable regardless. I want to just be clear about it here. He then moves on and admits to having conversations with another girl who hadn't made any public statements. There is one girl I spoke to in 2014 period a bit later. Her name is M. Originally, she never told me she was underage. She says she was older than me. I have a screenshot of this, but it doesn't matter, nor make it better. But years later, she contacted me and said she was actually underage. I apologized to her privately recently and told her I feel absolutely terrible about it. 
There's no graphic pictures or anything either that were exchanged, and she's from another country. Zero concedes that Katie's accusations were true, however, emphasizes that he didn't exchange any explicit images as he did in his response the day before. The vagueness of his address is also interesting. The ice cube thing referred to Katie's accusation that he would request her to do things on a fortnightly basis, something he ignored the day before and conveniently forgot from his messages in the screenshot she provided. His concession to her claims isn't even that surprising, because the screenshots he didn't respond to are very hard to explain other than him flirting with her and manipulating her to give a reaction. Who asks for a love letter on day two of their conversation with a 14-year-old fan? The trend with these concessions is his conviction that he has never exchanged graphic pictures with the girls. Another trend is that he claims in both scenarios not to have known the age of the girls until at least later in their conversations, suggesting the second girl catfished him. Despite conceding that these interactions did occur, and that Katie's accusations are generally true, he has maintained the defense of his character in this statement. He finishes by saying he wants to atone and for the discussion to stop. He says he's not a good person and his life story was not an excuse for his behavior. He says he doesn't deserve people's defense, announces that he would try to cancel his sponsorships, and that he would not make content anymore. At this point, the conversation would have continued unless there was some clear conclusion, and as indicated in his statement, he didn't want this situation to drag on further. He may have also feared what Jisoo had found in her fact-gathering for the document she had teased releasing, evident in how he preemptively named another person he had contact with. Getting on top of the story before it was released would limit its overall impact. Zero made it very clear in his three statements beforehand that he wasn't prepared to fight this beyond his terms. Tapping out early was his desired option. Before this twit longer, he announced a self-imposed ban from any Smash events on Twitter. He took this further in his twit longer, suggesting he would work to end any sponsorships he had. In response to that twit longer, two major partners announced their separation. Tempo Storm announced their severance, citing Zero's admission as a reason for their decision. Tempo was aware of the accusations and stated that an internal investigation had started before Zero conceded to Katie's allegations. They also suggested that they were going to connect him with professional counsel and rehabilitation resources to ensure it would never happen again. Facebook Gaming also announced they had separated in a quote suite of his twit longer. At this point, it seems most of the damage had been done, but the final blow would come in the form of a 64-page Google Doc. On July the 5th, a day after Zero conceded to Katie's accusations, Jisoo published her awaited document named The Truth About Zero, Katie, and Sky. Her document opens with a page outlining the reason why she created it, stating her intentions, reasonings, and addressing certain issues she may face. She makes it very clear that her own experiences will be discussed, and suggests she was going to remain impartial and also be truthful to her experiences. Whether that would be fulfilled was to be seen. She also restates her claim of receiving death threats, showing an email she received. After this, she moves on to address her personal issue with Zero. She elaborates on her accusation that Zero would harass her with explicit content when they were roommates in the Sky House. She claims she was speaking out against Zero because of his feigned ignorance towards the behaviour of other people in the community. She suggests that her lack of power in the house as a 15 or 16 year old meant she played along with his supposed behaviour. But all Jisoo provides is a retort to Zero's response in his second document, and it doesn't effectively substantiate her claims against him. Following this part, the original document contained 10 pages covering the allegations about Vanessa's age, Zero's treatment of her, and his potentially litigious nature. However, it's very important to note that after Jisoo's document was published, she removed these allegations from it and recanted them in tweets apologizing to Vanessa. Vanessa had reached out to the YouTuber Omni with a message asking him to publish a statement on her behalf. Omni included the messages from Vanessa, and says she just wants to be left alone. Jisoo was relatively prompt in correcting the error. This part of her document wasn't necessary, and the various screenshots of conversations between unknown individuals just introduced more questions leading to speculation. At this point, 
Her document is just a wordier version of her vague tweets, and isn't exactly the hard-hitting expose she had teased. However, the next part of the document is arguably what most people wanted to read. Katie was the story. Everything is about her. Her story shifted the narrative surrounding Zero's self-described naivety towards predatory behaviour within the Smash community. She's the one who provided clear accusations and clear evidence to support them. Zero is the one who decided to handpick what he was going to respond to, and tried to shift the narrative towards his awkward nature. Her credibility outweighed Zero's, and his concession cemented that. Jisoo provides extra context plus supporting testimonies, that strengthen Katie's story. Jisoo describes how she first discovered Katie, suggesting that she responded to a tweet quoting Zero begging her to DM them. She provides screenshots of an apparent conversation with Katie, where she explains the story we saw in the twit longer. She opens up to Jisoo, and describes who she is and how she felt, and reveals that she had screenshots of some conversations with Zero. But she also tells Jisoo some things that weren't included in her twit longer. In one message, she suggests at some point in the conversations, Zero had suggested sex, and that it would be legal in Chile. The fact it isn't in her twit longer leads to the assumption that she didn't have much to support that accusation other than memory. However, the most damning information from Jisoo's document was an additional screenshot that Katie had left out of her published story. It refuted Zero's claim that he didn't know Katie's age until later in their online relationship. In this screenshot, Katie is seen explicitly stating her age. This is from the first day of their interaction. It's screenshot number three in the series of messages Katie provided. Zero lied in his original response to Katie's allegations. He knew her age and proceeded to flirt with a 14-year-old fan, describing her as his secret and arranging fortnightly events where he would ask her for whatever he wanted. There is no way to plead ignorance. He unashamedly engaged with this 14-year-old girl as an adult and knowingly communicated with her in a manner beyond a typical fan interaction. Jisoo's document then provides testimony from another person who had a similar experience with Zero. However, they were not a minor and essentially outlined their interactions with him from around the same time. She claims this was included to validate the possibility of Katie's experience. She then includes messages from people who know Katie, and included text conversations after reaching out to her. The texts show Katie clarifying some of the information she published in her twit longer. She also says that if Zero told the truth and apologised, she would have forgiven him. Jisoo then moves on to Zero's twit longer and discusses the other individual he mentioned, naming her M. Jisoo shares messages that she received from M after Zero's second Google Doc. M states in these messages that she had been in contact with Zero the day before. Jisoo then elaborates on the messages, commenting on how he lied in his document, and then says, What I didn't expect was another victim to speak up about Zero having asked her to do the same things while she was underage, and talk about possibly flying over and meeting her at a hotel in person. M describes her experience with Zero, suggesting he said they had been in contact back in 2013. She also says Zero claims that he did not know her age and that she had lied to him about how old she actually was. She says he was trying to manipulate her based on her washed up memory, and that after reading his document, she does not believe him. She notes how they met through Twitch and started to use Skype. A screenshot of a conversation with Zero was also included, where he says that he's not very social, and had only really spoken to his mother and girlfriend over the past six years. This is probably what urged M to reach out to Jisoo after his response to Katie. M says her experience with Zero was similar to Katie's, but she claims Zero told her he would fly out to her in the Netherlands, or take her to the Dreamhack event in Sweden. M suggests that she was 16 in 2013, which would mean Zero was 18. Arguably, that's not as bad as him sexting a 14-year-old at 19. However, in her messages with Zero, he claims that she had lied about her age, suggesting she had told him that she was 20 rather than 16. He maintained that claim in his twit longer. The strength of M's accusation against Zero is definitely not as strong as Katie's, but his messages with her discussing his memory of their conversations indicate that they did have contact. Jisoo posits M's story as a way of supporting Katie's, she argues that Zero's final statement, his concession, was still lies, based on M's testimony. The document is an interesting contrast between Jisoo's personal experience and the experience of others. 
She posits herself as both the messenger and pariah trying to hold a community that wronged her accountable. Whether she was the correct person to platform and consolidate the stories of other women is much to be desired. However, her document does provide important context and further information that we may have never seen if each girl had fended for themselves. Jisoo includes another testimony that she received after the publication of the document that outlined another woman's experience with Zero. This person was not a minor when she talked to Zero back in 2014, but suggests his attitude towards women was poor, and he had treated her similarly to that of KT and M. The interesting thing about this testimony is that this person had released a twit longer outlining their experiences on June 26, without naming the subject of her story. She came out a week before Zero was even in the spotlight for his behaviour, and after Jisoo's document, she identified him as the subject. If anything, this shows Zero's inability to respectfully speak to women without seeing them as sex objects. The other stories merely serve to strengthen Katie's and validate what she described. The varying degrees of severity outline a pattern of behaviour, but his concession to Katie's accusations and the evidence she brought to the table was a key source of his reputation's decline. Once Katie's story and the accompanied accusations used to support hers are disclosed, Jisoo takes the document in a completely different direction, levying accusations towards Sky Williams based on her time in the Sky House. This part of the story isn't entirely relevant to Zero, and reveals a grudge she seemingly has because of what she alleged to have experienced with her own abuse. This is somewhat suggested in her closing comments. She explains that the situation became personal when Katie presented her allegations. Katie's story was seemingly unexpected. The original intention with even mentioning Zero was to pivot towards what happened in the Sky House. Katie's story is sandwiched between Jisoo's personal experiences with Zero and Sky Williams. Her story was the most important part of this document. It should have been the only part of this document. Jisoo's personal experiences were weak in comparison to what Katie was able to provide. Had there just been a focus on what he had confessed to, there wouldn't be much room for speculation to thrive. However, Jisoo's document seemingly marked the end of Zero's chapter in the story. He didn't respond, and his final statement ultimately marked the end of his defence. In late July, his Twitch account was banned, and by August, his social media went dark. After the events of July, Zero stepped back from the internet. Not much was heard from him, but Vanessa released an update in December 2020 discussing how July had impacted her. Being put in the spotlight like that, in front of hundreds of thousands of people, to, in front of the world, was very, very, very traumatic for me. That event gave me PTSD, like I've never suffered from PTSD or anything like that. Um, and it was just too much. From then, nothing was really said about Zero, other than maybe the odd murmur here and there. However, in March 2021, Vanessa announced on Twitter that Zero had tried to take his life. About a month after this news, fellow creator Avisu decided to check in on him with an interview. The reaction to this was rather negative and it was eventually removed by Avisu after people questioned its creation. Most notably, Jisoo directly criticised him, suggesting that the video was a slap in the face. Despite being taken down, it was immediately re-uploaded by other channels, and provided an interesting insight into Zero's mindset during and after the events of July 2020. The very last thing I posted, which was the, I think it was like that thing on Twitter, or I forget, but it was like the, 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 very, the very last thing I posted on Twitter, um, actually, I was gonna kill myself right there, um, and like I had it all ready. I was like, it was like late at night. I forget when it was exactly, but it was like a, it was like an awkward time. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna commit there. Um, I developed um, really, really, really bad PTSD. I, I, I do have um, additional things to say about the things that happened. There are some things I need to clear up. Every time I've tried to put myself together to do do something about it, it, it just, I don't know exactly what to say to like people that like really want me back. Cause it's like not something that I feel like I have any control over. And like, even if I wanted to, which I don't, I don't even know how I would do it. I, I know this sounds like very negative. I wouldn't just be able to say like, 
willy nilly. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, you know, I got it, you know, because it's not, it's not so simple, right? But like I said, like I, I, I do have some things I would like to clear up, and and I, I would love to you know do, do something about certain things in response to this video jisoo also tweeted are we just conveniently forgetting that he literally asked the 14 year old knowingly to send pictures of herself masturbating with ice cubes and offered to fly another minor out to do that in a hotel for him in november 2021 Zero returned in a video announcing his response to the allegations an entire year earlier, in which he outright denies all of the accusations made against him during the first days of July. A common misconception is that I have been framed as a liar and that I lied in all of my Twitter statements. This is not true. You can see this evidence in more detail in Technical's video. The reason I seem to switch stances is simply because at the time I did not have proper evidence witnesses that came forward later and i just did not have the full picture in front of me i also lost a lot of faith in if the public will actually believe my side of the story seeing how vicious people were during that period of time since at the time i pretty much only had my word and memory to defend myself i figure it will be a lot easier to just apologize than to fight it obviously now that i put it that way i made a tremendous mistake zero released four statements in july regarding the movement that was sweeping through the gaming industry including his own responses to accusations. His first statement was about people he either knew or was close with, facing allegations of misconduct, where he not only suggested that he didn't know what they had done, but also apologized for not being aware of it. That's what prompted Jisoo to make her first tweet. His response followed, and considering it was to a single tweet, it was a very comprehensive document outlining his time in the Sky House, and providing receipts of his conversations with Jisoo during this time. He even included a testimony from his girlfriend to support his response. His third statement came after Katie released her twit longer. In this document, he essentially agrees to disagree with Leffen and Jisoo, and apologizes for making them feel uncomfortable. He then selects seven of the 24 screenshots that Kate included in her twit longer, denied ever meeting, sending, or receiving explicit imagery from her, and claimed that he didn't know her age until later in their conversations. He apologizes throughout because the messages weren't appropriate whatsoever. He concluded that document with a long story that outlined his past trauma to contextualize why he was socially awkward. 60% of that document was about him. He only spent 20% addressing some of Katie's screenshots. The final kicker was obviously the shorter, more concise twit longer that seemingly marked his submission from the story. You have also probably heard of a so-called confession from my part. Simply put, this document is nothing more than a suicide letter that I wrote during a tremendous mental breakdown. I had fully planned to take my life right after posting that document because I pretty much lost all faith in that scenario seeing so many of my close friends deciding to take the situation to throw me under the bus for personal gain seeing how people were reacting in general and me just feeling like i could not defend myself properly pretty much took the last bit of hope that i had left and i decided not just to give up but to sabotage myself on purpose the statement he released conceding to katie's allegations and announcing that he had contact with another girl during that time was a big moment in the saga. It's directly linked to him being released by his gaming organization and dropped by Facebook. It was essentially a concession to the accusations levied by Katie and the admission to being in contact with another girl. However, the fact he described this as a suicide note is a morbid reframing of what was contained within that statement. Describing it as sabotage leads to the assumption that he's saying the contents of his statement were not true. However, his acknowledgement of Katie the day before and what was revealed in Jisoo's document puts this claim into disrepute. The screenshots support all of Katie's accusations. The only thing that's reliant on trusting her word is what she described as his worst request during their fortnightly arrangement, which he conveniently tried to reframe in his prior response. The only concession he makes here is that he tried to solicit explicit imagery, but then immediately denies receiving anything. Katie's 25th screenshot from Jisoo's document revealed that he was very much aware of her age and knowingly flirted with her. So what exactly is not true in this statement? He also went out of his way and acknowledged N's story despite her not coming out about it, but he denies doing anything wrong, suggesting he was catfished and nothing explicit was exchanged. Include what we learn from Jisoo's document 
and the messages between himself and M, his statement is very consistent to what he was saying privately days before. He even suggests he has evidence to prove his innocence. How it could be considered sabotage, despite defending himself throughout the statement, is truly bizarre. My question to Zero would be, what else would he have done? Was he going to release another response dodging Katie's accusations? Was he going to wait until Jisoo released something other than vague tweets about him? Why doesn't he show us the screenshot regarding M lying about her age? His story doesn't match the facts of the situation, and by recanting his statement, he is essentially trying to shift the blame for his career's decline from his statement to an orchestrated effort to ruin his life. But after taking time to reflect and think properly and review all of the evidence that came forward later on, I realized this was a big plot to assassinate my character and just, just destroy my life. Since then, I have retained legal counsel to take the necessary steps to deal with this scenario, and I'm also in the middle of a lawsuit with some of the involved parties in this case. This case is also more complicated than other cases because there's a lot of people involved, some of the parties are completely anonymous, and this all makes taking the right steps extremely difficult. I am doing my best, but it is not easy. Now, I need to make this very clear to everybody watching this video. I have never received explicit images from any underage individual. I have never sent explicit images to any underage individual. I have never made travel arrangements with ulterior motives with any underage individual. I have never been touched or touched in any shape or form any underage individual. And I have never had conversations with only the intention to groom an underage individual or take advantage of them. Anything you may have heard or seen that suggests otherwise is a lie. Moving forward, I will not be addressing this topic publicly anymore and I will let my legal team address anything that may surface from this topic. I am not putting myself out there for the game of social media allegations anymore. If you hear or see anything that may come up about this case in general, it is safe to assume that my team is taking care of it, but behind the scenes, not publicly. The most important part of this saga for Zero is to convince the public that he is trustworthy. This video revealed the intention to seek retribution for what happened in July 2020, rather than demonstrate his growth as a person. Whilst denying accusations and characterizations that a minority probably believed, he couldn't, in good faith, demonstrate remorse or understanding of the public's issue with him. Much like his initial response to Katie's story, there was a lack of focus on what she said and provided in July. It's very hard to look through all the screenshots and not concede to at least one of Katie's accusations without stating that Zero was not the person depicted in them. If he concedes that they are real, which he did twice in 2020, then at the bare minimum, he is admitting to knowingly flirting with a 14-year-old girl. Based on that information, the opinions held by others is not unreasonable. The biggest issue people had with Zero was his interactions with Katie. What's more concerning is that he relied on technicals, who had built credibility with his Skyhouse investigation, to detail why the events of July 2020 were an organized attempt to assassinate his character. However, that video produced a very divisive reaction, creating a rift within the commentary community based on how the video was presented. People who co-signed the investigation and vindication of Sky Williams, who were friends with technicals, criticized how Zero was portrayed and how the information was presented. There would be weeks of drama to follow the video, and there is still a feud because of what happened in November 2021. The technicals video was interesting because it was very strong in reinforcing the idea that Jisoo and Leffen's personal experiences were either exaggerated or contradictory to the testimony from other witnesses. However, when it discussed the experiences of other people, particularly Katie, there are concessions made that contradict Zero's assertion that everything is false. When this was brought up and questioned, all of the attention shifted towards internal disputes rather than the subject of the original issue. Because of this, Zero went relatively unchecked and was able to proceed with his plans unhindered. During the same month of his return, Zero filed a lawsuit against Jisoo and 10 other unidentified individuals for defamation and intentional infliction 
of emotional distress. The complaint alleged that before filing his lawsuit, Zero was successful and had a promising career ahead of him. However, in July 2020, Jisoo's document was published and circulated through various media channels. He claims the document included multiple falsehoods and defamatory claims against himself and others. He alleges that the direct result of Jisoo's documents was determination of his Twitch account, partnerships with Tempo Storm and Facebook Gaming, and irreparable damage to his reputation. He then lists the statements he found defamatory. The first was her tweet about Vanessa, where she claimed they had started dating when he was 20 and she was 15. The lawsuit says this was demonstrably false, and lists Vanessa's birth date as November 1997. Jisoo's retraction is noted, but the complaint argues that the damage had been done to his reputation. Jisoo's accusation in her document that Zero had physically abused Vanessa was listed as the second defamatory statement. However, that section of the document was removed hours after it was published. The fourth statement he found defamatory was was Jisoo's accusation that he showed her explicit images in the Sky House. These three statements were Jisoo-centric, based on her experience and unsanctioned accusations on behalf of Vanessa. However, the third defamatory statement was Jisoo's tweet published in response to Zero's interview with Avisu. Zero suggested that Jisoo accused him of being a pedophile in this tweet. The tweet referenced in this paragraph consists of two separate allegations. The first is what Katie described in her story, and the other is from M's accusation. The lawsuit alleges that Jisoo prefaced her tweet with a statement in her Google Doc that describes her response to the discovery of another story similar to Katie's. The lawsuit claims this statement was defamatory because Zero did not attempt to fly a minor out to him for sexual gratification. However, it does not refute Katie's allegations. Nowhere in this document is Katie's story referenced other than what was in Jisoo's tweet. Zero's second claim was for the intentional infliction of emotional distress, which is exactly for what it's named, and it concludes with Zero's request for compensatory damages, punitive damages, and whatever relief the court would find. Whilst a lawsuit was being filed, friends were at each other's throats regarding the circumstances of the situation. The noise that was generated from this feud allowed Zero to retract back into the shadows and await the results of his lawsuit. First off, just to clarify, when I say welcome back Zero, I mean welcome back to uploading content, not to smash points. It would be impossible for Zero to go to jail over this. He never exchanged any images. Every other story involves an adult, and he hasn't had a slip up in seven years. Soliciting nudes from a 14-year-old. That's what we're talking about, right? That's the thing that never happened again? Man, he was flirting with a 14-year-old. If I literally got exposed for doing this exact same thing seven years ago, it's reasonable to assume it's possible I could be doing it. He missed, he didn't even go to middle school a lot of the time. He was fucking bullied so much, he actually got into so many fights that he couldn't go to school until he was 16. And he tried to kill himself when he was 10 by jumping out of window. You, you, and again, you're doing it again. I'm asking a question on like what he would be, and you're giving me a sob story about how he tried to kill himself by jumping out of a fucking window. Dude, if you don't fucking care about stopping the source of the problem, then you don't care about the problem at stopping all. Stopping the source of the problem? Am I gonna get a time? machine and go beat the shit out of Zero's dad? In the last big video I made, which spoke about the allegations to my name, I mentioned that I was launching a lawsuit. That lawsuit is now fully concluded. The details can be viewed in this document on screen right now, which you can pause the video and take a look at that. But to summarize, the document in which all of the allegations made to my name has now been fully deleted. However, this document has been deleted by the person who made it, Jizu, as part of this legal conclusion. So to pretty much to put it bluntly, that movie with that individual is fully resolved at this point in time. We are not meant to address the topic further 
and I kindly ask everyone watching to just not go and harass any party involved in this, especially her, because now this is just fully resolved. After nearly a year of back and forth, the lawsuit had reached its conclusion. The settlement included a joint statement outlining the results of their agreement. They both called on their followers to cease any harassment based on the July events. What harassment entails is rather ambiguous. The statement then outlines concessions both parties had agreed upon. Zero concedes that he did not see his time in the Sky House the same way Jisoo did. He apologizes to her for his role in her feeling harassed and demeaned, and regrets that he exacerbated her pain through his public discussions about those experiences. Jisoo concedes that her statements regarding Vanessa were inaccurate, and apologizes for them. They conclude by suggesting that they did not want to waste more time, money, and energy on the lawsuit, and decided to resolve it instead of continuing with it. Interestingly, there is no reference to the tweet from April. As part of the settlement, Jisoo deleted her document and tweets, and it seems that Technicals deleted his video. Whatever else they may have agreed is unknown and is probably confidential. But this wasn't a clear-cut decision. There was no winner, and there was no judgement given on whether Jisoo defamed Zero. The average viewer wouldn't go out of their way to actually see what happened in this lawsuit, nor would they pay the clerk's fee to access the documents. However, because we need to be thorough in this story, I spent the budget on accessing some of the key documents in the case. So what happened to this lawsuit? Jisoo's response to the lawsuit was to file an anti-slap motion. As such, there was a back and forth between the two parties as to what should or shouldn't be struck from the complaint. Declarations were given and Jisoo decided to file 190 pages worth of testimony and also called on a few other people to give theirs. Zero's was short and to the point, and Vanessa also testified. After objections regarding evidence were made, the court decided on whether to dismiss the lawsuit. On March 9, 2022, the court released its ruling on Jisoo's motion to strike. Three of Zero's four claims for defamation were struck because the statute of limitations had expired. Because of emergency protocols in response to the pandemic, Zero had until October 1, 2021 to file his lawsuit against Jisoo for these three claims to be admissible. He filed his lawsuit on November 19. Therefore, he couldn't include them in his complaint. The reason he missed this deadline is more than likely based on the fact he needed to use Technical's video as evidence in his declaration. As a result, Zero's lawsuit was reduced to only one defamation claim, which was the tweet from April 2021. From the initial complaint, he only denied the statement that he offered to fly another minor out to a hotel for sexual gratification, and offered no response to the first part of that tweet which was about one of Katie's three allegations. Judge Myers' comments on this claim are a very interesting read. The plaintiff's only evidence that the statement was false is paragraph 7 of his declaration, in which he states, On April 28, 2021, Cho posted via Twitter on the account of Jisoo SSBM that I sought to fly a minor on a plane to meet me in a hotel for sexual gratification purposes. That statement was false. I have never asked a minor to fly on a plane to meet me in a hotel for sex. The plaintiff's declaration is curiously worded because it is ambiguous in that it can be read to deny only part of the defendant's statement relating to flying a minor on a plane, but not the part of the statement about soliciting explicit photographs. If the plaintiff could, under oath, assert that both claims were false, he would have done so unambiguously. Because the plaintiff does not deny, in his declaration, the part of the claim about soliciting explicit pictures, the plaintiff offers no evidence to show that the statement was false, and the court could hold the plaintiff to that, and decline to permit him to proceed on this part of the only remaining claim which is not barred by the statute of limitations. The court is inclined to give this plaintiff the benefit of the doubt, and treat the plaintiff's failure to deny the whole statement with greater specificity, merely as a drafting error. This means Zero did not deny Katie's allegation in this lawsuit, nor did he provide evidence to refute Jisoo's tweet other than a statement of denial. The judge herself finds it very bizarre that he would only deny part of Jisoo's statement and gives him the benefit of the doubt, suggesting it was a mistake in the draft of the complaint. That benefit of the doubt is the sole reason the lawsuit was allowed to proceed. The other aspect of Zero's complaint was that Jisoo had intentionally inflicted emotional distress. Judge Myers ruled that this would be struck from the complaint because she believed that it only served as a loophole to claim damages despite the statute of limitations expiring on three of the alleged defamatory statements. As a result, Judge Myers ruled that Jisoo's anti-slap was granted in part and denied in part 
based on the reasons given in the ruling. Zero was ordered to file an amended complaint within 15 days, and Jisoo was to respond in kind. Despite being struck, I do believe that Zero's first and second defamatory claims are valid, those pertaining to Jisoo's claims about Vanessa. The fourth claim is less clear, but I also don't believe it was a factor in Zero's reputation being damaged. The third claim, the sole surviving claim in the lawsuit, was arguably the one that contained an allegation that could be contributed to Zero's reputation being tarnished. However, as noted by the judge, he doesn't actually deny trying to solicit explicit images from a minor, and suggested that not doing so may have been an error. With that, he was given the opportunity to correct that in an amended complaint. The amended complaint was filed on March 24, and surprisingly, the only changes made are the absence of the four claims struck in the judge's ruling. He didn't amend his complaint to deny both statements in Jisoo's tweet. In fact, he didn't change anything at all. The judge gave him the benefit of the doubt after questioning his ambiguity. Why would you only deny half the statement if it wasn't true? He ignored that, presumably because his lawsuit was to simply disrupt the narrative and financially drain Jisoo. They eventually entered case management where they decided to end the lawsuit through settlement. The exact details are unknown, but from their statement, there were some concessions on either side and the agreement to not talk about each other ever again. Once they settled, they moved to dismiss the case. It was initially proposed to be dismissed without prejudice, meaning Zero could return and try again. However, a few days later, that was amended to dismiss it with prejudice. It was permanently ended and closed for good. Zero parading the settlement as a win is far from the truth. The final complaint was worn down to a single allegation of defamation, an allegation that the judge referred to as a drafting error in their ruling. The amended complaint didn't change the claim he made in his original lawsuit. This was a massive failure on Zero's behalf. It was a waste of money, and all he was able to achieve was a document getting deleted and Jisoo agreeing to not talk about it anymore. What she conceded to in the joint statement was very minimal compared to what he did, and it didn't address the only tweet he could sue her for. Whether this lawsuit could actually prove that Jisoo was the reason for his damaged reputation is also questionable. His tweet longer was the reason he lost sponsorships, Tempo Storm and Facebook Gaming attributed their decision to that statement. Regardless, from the public perspective, the biggest thing that people care about is Katie's accusations because they were the most substantial of any made during that week of July. So this is what he had to say about Katie after the settlement. I am aware that there are further allegations made to my name by an individual that goes of the name of Katie. To my knowledge, this individual, Katie, made their statement with the assistance of Jisoo and also included their statement in the bigger document that Jisoo created. To be fully transparent, I have been pursuing this individual for a while to be able to fully resolve the issue through the appropriate legal channels. However, we believe that this individual is intentionally avoiding any sort of contact with my legal team. Because of this, I am unable to fully resolve the issue properly through the legal channel. However, I do have additional evidence to defend myself with, but this evidence is being reserved for legal purposes should this issue come up again in a court of law. Essentially, I don't want my life to be held up by allegations made by a completely anonymous individual. To further clarify, allegations that I fully deny, and their biggest allegation which claims soliciting, there is no evidence This for. is very dangerous. It's predatory. And it highlights a side of Zero that we had only seen glimpses of. Zero explicitly confirms his intent to find Katie with the sole purpose of being litigious. What he means by properly resolve the issue with Katie is a thinly veiled threat at litigation. He wants to initiate a lawsuit to have her recant her allegations. However, Katie's statement was published in 2020. Following the same logic applied to the ruling in his lawsuit against Jisoo, the statute of limitations would have expired. So I don't know what he would sue her for if it can't be defamation. What makes it more bizarre is that he claims to have more evidence to prove that he was innocent, but instead of releasing it and using his much larger platform to clear his name, he insists on sicking his lawyers on someone without a platform who's probably just living their life. It doesn't exactly display a great deal of character hiding behind a threat to financially destroy someone if you're claiming to possess information to clear your name, especially at a time when your social status has been condemned and it doesn't appear as if people are going to forget about it anytime soon. I wouldn't have an issue, nor would this be a discussion, had he returned and taken responsibility for his conversations with Katie. 
Had he expressed genuine remorse, people would have been less likely to condemn him for his actions when he was 19. However, despite the screenshot evidence and what is discussed in Technical's video, his move to completely deny her allegations makes it extremely hard for people to accept his return to public life without protest. The events that transpired with Katie happened many years before the revelation and fallout from her accusations. Flirting and soliciting nude imagery from a person five years your junior would be fine under mature circumstances. However, this was a relationship between a 14-year-old schoolgirl and a 19-year-old adult with an online platform and audience. It's legally questionable, but we won't observe this through the criminal lens, rather the morality of such behavior and its implications. Zero is beyond being afforded the benefit of the doubt. I mean, the judge overseeing his lawsuit gave him that, and he willfully ignored it in his amended complaint. His recent behavior has been rather erratic, Twitter being a place where he has shown signs of frustration. Tweets referencing Katie's story are still being published, and that's gonna happen because he has yet to actually provide anything to contest what was said more than two years ago. The worst part for him is that tweets that reference anything to do with his controversies gain traction. His responses are not a good look either. Late last year, during Ludwig's chess boxing event, he tweeted asking to be put in the ring because during his self-discovery arc, he decided that boxing was his thing, and someone suggested EDP-445. Zero's response to this was to snap in a very dramatic and vague manner. Zero is definitely not comparable to that man, he is correct in that statement. But the way he described his case is very intriguing. He flat out denies the events that Katie described, he claims to have evidence which he's withholding for when he finds Katie, but in this tweet, he concedes that something did happen. During his return, he listed things that Katie didn't even allege, denying that he had sent or received explicit images. But none of that matters, because the screenshots are the things that people have access to. So if you don't deny having any contact with her, then that leads to the reasonable opinion that you knowingly flirted with a 14-year-old fan as an adult. Sure, the comparison is hyperbolic, but his reaction is just fuel to add to the fire. This isn't even his only reaction. He responded to another person, who again is hyperbolic, but the contents of his tweets are insane. He's genuinely under the impression that his settlement with Jisoo is proof of innocence. He was forced into an agree-to-disagree conclusion for Jisoo's supposed personal experiences with him, and she conceded to something that no one really gave credence to. Just because her document was deleted, doesn't mean he's been vindicated. Technical's video, Vindicating Zero, was also taken down, so the same sentiment could be considered there. But the settlement statement didn't acknowledge any of the other allegations, and Jisoo didn't denounce them. The only claim Zero had left in the lawsuit was Jisoo's 2021 tweet, which confused the judge because of his ambiguous denial of M's story, but not Katie's. The judge literally gave him the benefit of the doubts because they thought it may have been a mistake. If he has the evidence to deny Katie's allegations, as he proudly stated in the video announcing the lawsuit's conclusion, why didn't he amend his complaint against Jisoo to include the evidence he supposedly has that denies Katie's allegations, and in doing so, prove his innocence? That is the big question, and recent events don't make for very convincing reading. At the end of last year, an individual on Twitter spectacularly failed to link Katie to an account they had supposedly discovered based on coincidental similarities. It led to a person on Twitter being identified as Katie. Zero quote tweeted this thread and told people to have a look at it. However, it turns out the Katie that was found wasn't actually the Katie who accused Zero of trying to solicit explicit images. He even made the person reach out to technicals to verify her identity. This is insane. Some random person on Twitter drops a thread that identifies someone completely unrelated to Katie, and Zero highlights that, suggesting it's something substantial. Then the person gets harassed as a result. That's not rational behavior, nor does it convince anyone that he's got anything to deny Katie's accusations. It's extremely unhinged behavior. This isn't about what Zero did nearly a decade ago. It's a question of his character. 
His behavior during and beyond his return has revealed something that no one could truly observe, and his vindictive and litigious actions are a testament to his character. Zero's entire reputation hinges on those 25 screenshots we all saw in July 2020. Mostly all of Katie's accusations are based on what we can see in those conversations from 2014. We know that Zero was aware of her age over the three months they talked because a screenshot proves this. We can clearly identify that Zero was flirting with Katie because he was not very subtle. Whether he manipulated her is an opinion rather than an accusation but given the context of the situation, it's not an unreasonable one to have. The final, most controversial accusation is the one that doesn't have direct evidence to support, but there is something that Katie provided to justify her claim. We don't have proof of the alleged worst thing he asked for, but we do have examples of him asking her to do things. Regardless of Katie's identity, Zero was under the impression that he was messaging a 14-year-old fan. The only way he could conceivably walk away from the saga is if these screenshots are false, but that's never been his argument. So whatever supposed evidence he was so excited to reveal that he may have, if it doesn't contest those screenshots, then it doesn't really matter. It would also be very interesting to see what he would actually try and sue her for, considering he barely scraped through with his lawsuit against Jisoo. Zero's return is a great example of how easy it is for a story to descend into chaos. The fluid narratives make it impossible to pinpoint the most accurate retelling, and Zero's move to completely 180 on everything he said in July introduced so much doubt. Despite these inconsistencies, and Zero's reliance on what his lawyers direct him to say, the one thing that never changed throughout the saga was Katie's story. Traumatizing a young teen for self-satisfaction, then years later expressing remorse for those actions when they come forward, is ultimately the least he could have done. But for him to retract any apology, and try to punish the girl for sharing her story, is an insight into the character that was originally admonished. Jisoo's credibility is no longer a factor in this saga, nor did it really ever hold much weight over what Katie published. Katie's story was, and is, the reason people ostracized and cancelled Zero and it's the reason why there's still a divide surrounding his return. These situations are always messy because of the time between the incident and its reveal. At the end of the day, this is a situation where it's ultimately upon the observer to gauge their own opinions based on the facts. I've given you as much context as possible, what you believe is not for me to decide, but there's no sitting on the fence. I wouldn't choose to associate with Zero, and I don't think he should be welcomed back with open arms without at least apologizing to Katie. It's what she deserves. But as we know all too well, Katie's story isn't the last, and Zero's behavior isn't an anomaly. There are more creators with stories yet to be told. So take this as another tale of caution.